Yoga is a word which refers to a program of investigation into the nature of actuality. Yoga of Radiant Presence essentially consists of exploring the nature of experiencing in itself rather than attending to the supposed contents of experience. Uh, This exploration is affected by directing attention towards the actual event of experiencing and away from apparent contents of experience such as situations, objects, entities, etc. Experience itself has a very strange nature. All human thought is oriented towards supposed contents of experience, but experience itself is not approachable in terms of such thought because its inherent nature and properties are unaddressable by the logic inherent within relational, object-oriented thought. The nature and properties of the actuality of experience are entirely alien to the properties attributed to objects and situations within experience by the logic of thought. I'll be, um, well, I'll be going into the, ra- the details and ramifications of this. Um, this morning. Since thought is useless in the investigation of experience itself, then another medium must be employed. That medium is attention. Attention is actual, irrational, inclusive, that is non-relational, hyper-intelligent. <clears throat> the irrational intelligence of attention transcends human logic. So the primary learning curve in this yoga is becoming accustomed to its transhuman, irrational mode of order, meaningfulness. <laughs> so, simply notice that experience is spontaneously occurring. Of course, thought about it will be present, but noticing that experience, notice that experiencing is not affected by thought and such thought occurs within experience but with no impact on experiencing itself. Notice that exactly what experiencing consists of and what is happening as it occurs and how it happens are entirely unthinkable, although explorable with absolute intimacy by attention. The challenge in this yoga is the seduction of your habitual orientation to conceptual interpretation of experience. This is addressed by non-resistance. As you become aware of orienting in terms of an interpretive framework, simply again notice that the presence of experience is occurring as the context for that interpreting and give attention to that. Notice that interpretation of content of experience and the spontaneous, autonomous presence of actual experiencing are not a dichotomy, not mutually exclusive, but rather that the presence of experiencing is unswervingly the actual context for any interpreting that may seem to be present in experience, and that any interpreting in no way affects the present actuality of experiencing. Notice that the actuality of experiencing is present, is in fact presence, and it intrinsically presents with an infinite quantity of apparent perceived experiential characteristics in an ongoing, unstoppable, radiant dynamism. Notice that this radiant presence is in fact the absolutely inclusive soul event and that any and all other eventfulness is in actuality some sub-qualification of this soul prime actuality wholeness. Notice that the being and mode of occurrence of this presence is entirely independent. Is that a typo? Where's my secretary? What am I trying to say here? Maybe. Yes, oh, there's another there. My bad. Notice that the being and mode of occurrence of this presence is entirely independent of the specific characteristics of how it may be appearing. 
and this is the other guy. So that's quite a mouthful. So we'll um, pull it apart a little bit and make it a little more manageable. <coughs> so. <coughs> Human thought is effortlessly and spontaneously oriented towards the supposed contents of experience. Um, objects, things, events, you know, people, places, things to do, what's happening, situations, all of this. All of these, all of this mode of orienting is orienting towards fantasy. None of these things actually exist. They are hypotheses that are generated by the imagination. The only thing that actually exists is the actual um, field of experiencing, of your experiencing. That's the only thing that exists. When you were born, you didn't know anything. You didn't know what anything was. You couldn't think. You had no relational ability in terms of this is this and that's that. It was just, wow, you know, here I am. And here I am is just the whole smear, the whole field of experience. Right? Your experiencing was it. And then, of course, as you began to grow and mature and so on, you were beginning to indoctrinate it, you know, that, oh, there seems to be, you know, other shapes and colors moving around. And maybe they're independent, maybe they're separate from me. You know, maybe they're this, maybe they're that. And all of this is very reinforced by language. Conceptual thought comes in, and all of a sudden you can designate, you know, uh, by now most of us can look at anything and know, and come up with words for it, and descriptions for it, and basically boilerplate bullshit about it. Um, all of which is an abstraction. Because the actuality is the field of your experiencing which is right here right now it's real it's actual and it's the soul actuality all of the qualification all of the definition all of the naming and all that is it ab is abstractions and abstractions exist solely in imagination so it's a fantasy so the only thing you really know is the presence of your being the presence of your experiential field Everything and anything else you can claim to know verbally or think that you know conceptually is abstractions, i.e. hypotheses at best and just outright fabrications and pretense and insanity at worst. <clears throat> so that's, in a nutshell, uh, an overview of the situation. <clears throat> So, in a sense, it's almost as if there were two worlds that coexist. There's the world of the actual presence of, you know, I'm calling it your experiential field, just say the presence of, of your experience. That, that is a fact, in fact it is the fact, the sole fact. And then there's this other world, this apparent world of abstractions, consisting of all of the mental um, narration and interpretation um, of what is supposedly going on in, in that. Oh, there's a world. Oh, this is Seattle. Oh, I'm a human being. Oh, these are human beings. There are other human beings. I'm a, a different human being. They're in bodies. I'm in a body. There's space. There's time. There's causality. There's the internet. There's, you know, all, I mean, just every, anything. Everything and anything. All of this stuff is um, uh, abstractions that exist as a, a, a you know a, a, a pseudo coherent <laughs> edifice in your imagination, all of which exists in the actuality of the presence of the field of your experience. So. Now, of course, as human beings, we're very heavily indoctrinated into giving a lot of attention to the content. You know, what are you doing? Who are you doing? What are you up to today? You know, who's going on? What happened yesterday? You know, 
um, you know, your life sucks because A, B, and C. You really hope to do such and such, you know, before you die, and this, whatever, right? Just all of this narration that we can all effortlessly regurgitate. It's all imaginary. It all exists solely in the world of um, interpretive, conceptual, imaginary abstractions. All of which exists within the actuality, the actual presence of the field of your experience, which is always right here, right now, of course. The problem, the challenge um, in spirituality um, that this so-called yoga um, attempts to address is that normal modes of human thought are completely inadequate to engage with the actuality the way it really is. Simply because the actuality the way it is is utterly unlike anything and everything you have ever thought of or or capable of thinking of conceptually. (laughs) When you think of things, they're things. They're differentiable from other things. They They are this or that. They have some degree of stability. They have orientations. They exist in a particular place in a particular time. They exist in relationship to other things. They have, um, they may have color, they may have, you know, form, they may have this, they may have that. All, basically all, the entire, the entire toolbox of tools that the conceptual mind uses to differentiate, you know, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, anything, um, doesn't actually apply to what this actuality is because it is different. It has different aspects in every regard. It has different qualities in every regard. It's, it's freaking weird compared to anything and everything that we're used to relating to as an actuality. And surprisingly, all the things we're relating to as actualities don't actually exist as such. The only thing that actually exists is this unutterable weirdness that the experiential field actually consists of. So there's this unbridgeable disjunct between what you are capable of thinking of and the way reality is. They cannot meet, they cannot find the common ground because the actual properties, the actual characteristics of actuality are not addressable by the relational logic of conceptualization. It just can't be done. It's not that we're not smart enough, it's not that you know, we haven't thought about it cleverly enough. It just cannot be done. It's apples and oranges. <clears throat> and but of course as human beings we're very heavily biased towards and, and strongly addicted to this mental qualification. And so we have all of these elaborate philosophies and and spiritual hierarchies and theories and all of this stuff intended to try to address or in any way indicate or, or incorporate um, this actuality as it is. But it's a, it's a losing task. It cannot be done in those terms. It cannot be done by that medium. It can only be done by itself. Because its nature is of course consonant with its properties so it's capable of being with itself as it is whereas conceptual analysis is incapable of being with it as it is because any and all of the properties that um, conceptual analysis can apply do not apply to this actuality what color is experience? how big is experience? how small is experience? How long is experience? How short is experience? How good is experience? How bad is experience? How anything, how any word you can throw out is experience. It's, it, it doesn't mean experience in itself is, you know, the, 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 the inclusive continuum of all qualities. What, what thing has all qualities? 
What thing is red, blue, and green, and not red, blue, and green all at once? What thing is here and not here all at once? What thing is big and not big all at once? You know, actuality actually is. Actuality is where all of these qualities and more can be found, supposedly. And yet it itself transcends all of these specifics. So, the, uh, the conceptual way of approaching this actuality is doomed to failure. But as human beings, we have a very typically a very strong investment in approaching things that way because our whole sense of who we are and what we do and you know what we you know from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, what you're basically doing is this conceptual mode of approaching your your world, your reality, um, and so it's it's. It's 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 a sharp learning curve to to develop or or come to another way of approaching this. <clears throat> but fortunately, another way is available. Unfortunately, it's easy and effortless and fun to use. Um, the trick is to stumble onto, to notice, to appreciate it as it actually is and, and avoid the pitfall of falling into a conceptual pretense that you're doing that, which is, of course, very easy to do. Um, you know, the mind effort, you know, continually is analyzing, continually is, is narrating, continually is interpreting. It can't be stopped. It doesn't need to be stopped. It's actually is not actually an issue. But to but to come to see that and come to be be with that um, can be um, a challenge at first, or even not at first, depending upon um, your situation and what you have to bring to the table. <clears throat> <clears throat> Told me to call me here. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but fortunately, like I say, this medium of engagement, this irrational direct mode of engagement with this transcendental actuality that this presence is, that your experiential field actually is, is already. Here, it's already fully engaged, it's already working. You've already been using it every instant of your being. Um, so, it, so it's not a matter of learning to do something that you aren't doing. Um, it's it's um, ultimately more a matter of recognizing and coming to appreciate something that you're not used to noticing or acknowledging um, that you're doing. And um, so, you know, I, I typically, I often use the uh, we're noticing to refer to this, this engaging this alternative way of being with your experience. This, this um, you know, this non, non-human, not this non-consensus reality way of being with your experience. Because it's really noticing what is already the case. It's noticing something that you're already doing, so to speak, something that's already happening, and um, appreciating it. I mean, you appreciate it because it's already happening, but typically it's unappreciated because typically we're lost in our in our conceptual interpretation of what we think we're doing, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything that's actually going on. I mean, in short, human beings are all stone bonkers. Human beings are all completely insane. What we think we're doing and how we think we're doing it is complete fabrication. It has no basis in reality whatsoever. And so, in one, in a very fundamental sense, um, this this yoga is a, a, a coming to or a, a flirtation with, or an attempt to come to sanity, an attempt to come to what's actually going on as it is actually going on, as opposed to being lost in fantastic and utterly absurd misinterpretations of what's going on, which normal consensual consensus human reality consists of. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
the fortunate thing about actual reality, the fortunate thing about this transcendental presence is it is already being engaged with. You are already engaged with it. So it's not like you need to develop new skills or new new um, talents or learn to do something completely utterly foreign. And the way it's being engaged with is um, by attention. Now, attention is very interesting. Attention is a, a, attention is a word, of course. So the actuality of attention of attention is completely unlike anyone's idea of what attention is, because all actuality is completely unlike anyone's idea of it. So, what is attention? What is attention? Attention is the spontaneous engagement of reality with itself. So what's seeing your experience right now? I mean, just actually, concretely, what is seeing your experience? You, know, you can't find anything. It's not like, you know, there's, you know, there's a little guy sitting on a chair over there with a telescope and he, he's seeing my experience and that's who I really am. It's, it's, the experiential field is being seen but there's no seer. It's not being seen from anywhere. It's just here. And this hereness is a being seen. This hereness is a seeing. Actuality is always seeing itself. It appears, it becomes actual through seeing itself. It's not something you're doing. You're not seeing your experience by trying. It's like, let me try and see my... You can't make it go away. It spontaneously, intrinsically, sees itself. It is engaged with itself. It's self-engaged. Of course, these ideas like, like seeing and, and that it's doing it and that it's engaged and it's engaged with itself are inaccurate because it dualizes it. It turns it into those two things. There's it and then it somehow is seeing itself as if that was a kind of a looping around. And that's inaccurate. It's not like that. The way it actually is cannot be said, so there's no point trying to say it or think it. But in effect, it is seeing itself. And that is what's going on every instant of your being. Is that transcendental reality is seeing itself. That's what your experience is. What you are is the transcendental reality that is seeing itself. And what you are is the transcendental reality that's being seen. It's very simple. Um, but don't worry about making sense of it, because that, that, as soon as I as soon as I say it or put it into words, it instantly becomes bullshit. Because no concept can be accurate. No concept can be um, uh, uh, can actually accurately indicate. Actuality as it is. Actuality is completely transcendental. And transcendental is another nice word that doesn't mean what it sounds like it means. It doesn't mean what you think it means. You know, this is completely transcendental, which simply refers to the fact that it's unutterably, radically, inconceivably over the top weird. <laughs> There's no way you can deconstruct it. There's no way you can get a handle on it. There's no way you can figure out how it works, or even if it works, or even if, if there is an it to work. It's just weirder than that. So it transcends all logic. It transcends all analysis. It transcends getting a handle on it. It transcends making sense of it. It's just utterly, ridiculously beyond the beyond. It's utterly bizarre. It's bizarre to the power of bizarre. So... And, but, but we can say inaccurately that this is seeing itself spontaneously, intrinsically, unstoppably, eternally. And that um, attention is the human word which most closely approximates this seeing. Now, you may be used to thinking of attention as something that you can sort of steer or direct. You know, please look over here, look over here. Think of this, you know, don't think of that. But, of course, if you look very closely at that action, all these kinds of actions, the actuality is weirder than that, 
and the way it works is weirder than that and it kind of feels like you're doing it but at the same time it's weirder than that um, you know this uh, part of the part of the elusive nature of all of this is um, uh, it's participatory which is very weird you know um, so we can feel you can feel like you're doing something you can feel like well yeah I'm here and I'm like I can I have I can do certain things and, and try to not do certain things it's, it's kind of a, a felt sense of participation of, of actual functioning to some degree you know I can move my hand or I can not move my hand so I'm doing that and then I'm not doing it so that that feels yeah it kind of feels like that doesn't it it's not like it's just happening utterly spontaneously in one sense there's a kind of a participation in action and activity and engagement and functioning and yet again if you try and look very precisely and closely at exactly how that works and what's going on it gets weird but it does feel like that so this is you know we can say that this is participatory so it's not that I'm doing all of it but there is a certain sense in which I am participating with the doing and perhaps certain senses in which the participation with the doing transcends what feels like individuality to me so you know the, the, the sunlight is appearing in the sky outside I see this so, and I'm waving my hand, right? So I'm doing this, but I'm not doing that. It feels like. But in actuality, what's doing both those things is exactly the same thing. And the way in which they happen is exactly the same way. But they feel, but they feel it, has a, it has a range of, of, of feeling, of seeming to be um, in different ways. Um, so this is part of the weirdness of it all. <coughs> Anyway, so um, attention is the self-engagement of this actuality with itself. It happens spontaneously, but it is participatory. It can feel like you're kind of there and you can kind of engage in it or not to various degrees with some sort of pseudo-voluntarity. Uh, and, or not, you know. I, you can... You can you can look where you want to look, but you also find yourself looking in places you're not intending to look. You just sort of look there. You know, your attention is drawn to places. You can direct your attention, but sometimes your attention is just you know, zooming around and zipping around and zooming in and zooming out and floating around. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. It's a weird phenomenon. So there's degrees in which it can feel more personally participatory and less personally participatory. But that's that's in, in, inaccuracy that's over interpretation um, in actuality it's all the same event happening in the same way and it's all the engagement of this with itself this is fundamentally a seeing this is not a doing um, very much like a dream is fundamentally a seeing and not a doing there can seem to be all sorts of doing going on but the doing is seen and even, even in your experience, you could say, there's a, even all the doing that happens is basically seen to be that. So even if I'm, you know, I'm here and I'm talking and I'm thinking of what to say and I'm waving my arms around doing all this stuff, and I'm doing that, but I'm actually seeing that happening with a sense, a participatory sense of some degree of doing and some degree of not doing, Right? So, in other words, I recommend be, you know, and, and again, uh, we're, we're sort of, we're looking at a whole tree and we're wandering it on little twigs, so don't worry about making sense of any little twig we happen to be on in the big picture over the course of the next couple of days. This, this will tend to make more sense or not. <laughs> um, so don't worry too much about individuality, don't worry too much about participation. Basically, attention is spontaneously intrinsically happening it cannot not happen this cannot not be looking at itself this cannot not be is that the right thing? cannot not yeah that would this cannot not be engaged with itself it can't, not, it can't be unengaged with itself 
Existence is engagement. Being is engagement. Presence is engagement. Um, another aspect of presence uh, uh, and attention, which is which is very uh, fortuitous and quite interesting, is it's hyper intelligent. It is inconceivably intelligent, functional, capable. It's it's the mega magician. It has ultra super. Um, abilities and functionalities so in this instant this looks at itself effortlessly instantaneously with zero processing time instantly sees every single color and luminosity in your field of vision instantly hears every sound in your field of hearing instantly perceives every you know whatever in your field of mentality and so on and so on and so forth extending through infinite dimensions of, of subjective experiential presence all of this is present in the instant with no processing with no lag time I mean that's some serious chops that's some serious I mean Apple was jealous of, <laughs> of this shit I mean this you know the inherent intelligence is inconceivably powerful and you experience it every moment as the profound inconceivable readout of the information presented in your experiential field um, experiential field is infinitely differentiated for example every single pixel of every of every aspect of, of your different dimensions of your experience are completely unique and different from every other pixel of every aspect of your experience no matter how fine you make the pixels no matter how much you zoom in in your field of vision right now you're seeing every color you see is exactly that shade of color in that instant at that point and the point right next to it is a different shade. And the, the first point that's that shade is already some different shade in the next instant because it's all continually fluctuating and morphing and drifting. And so... Do we see that? Or of course you see it. Or do we just zone it out? It's, well, no, that's, no you, you're seeing it. Whether you're aware of seeing it is irrelevant. That's, that's, that's another issue that's getting ahead of ourselves. Um, so... So this actuality is a self-engagement. It is engaged with itself. It is engaged with itself hyper-intelligently and sensitively. It's not just an inert mechanical engagement. It's not just like a stone that's just pushing on itself or something. It's, you know, imagine the most inconceivable sentience, the most inconceivable intelligence dreaming with itself, looking at itself, dancing with itself in its own energy, imagination, whatever, new age bullshit, you know, metaphor. That's what this is. It already is that. It can't not be that. That's what it's made of. So, if there is presence, it is, it will look like experience. Presence is, cannot be present except as experienced present. Presence. Presence is experience. Experience is presence. Experience is reality. Reality is experience. Experience is presence. No, 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 no. So, actuality, which is right here, and you're all you're, you're all very familiar with this. Simple, the simple actuality of your field of experience. It's undeniably present. It's here. You know, presence is an interesting word. It's an interesting notion. You can't pin down exactly what it is, but it's intuitively very obvious. If I say, is your experiential field present? You know, it's a no-brainer to say, what? Well, duh, of course it's present. It's right here. In fact, it, in fact, here is just a euphemism for its being. <laughs> you know, when you say here, you're referring to in your experiential field. So, you know, it's, it's self-evident. It's self-verifying. It's in, intuitively obvious that presence is presence and what presence is. But of course you start looking at, well, what is that exactly? How does it work? How, what does presence mean? What would not presence look like? You know? And right away, bang, you just, you're lost. Because it's not rational. This presence that is here makes absolutely no sense. What it is, how it is, any aspect of it is completely irrational, complete gibberish. You know, you, you go completely nuts if you try and pin down what presence is. But fortunately, you don't need to, because here it is, and it's already a done deal. Um, 
so this is this is you know uh, this is one illustration of of every aspect of this yoga is that um, if, when you begin looking at when you begin studying what is actual here what you actually are what this actually is it makes absolutely no sense and will drive you completely insane if you try and pin it down but you don't need to that's the good news it's, it's already done you're already here it's already happening the, you know it's already the machinery the machinery is already running with 100% efficiency and you're it so it's all a done deal so this yoga is kind of nice because it's an effortless it's an effortless playful joy of just looking at what's already happening it's nothing you need to do it's not like you need to develop some new skills or ramp up something or try to do this or try to not do that or something like that just look around and go oh yeah wow pretty amazing not not yet I'm, I'm, I'm just warming up we'll, do you want questions or do you want to wait yeah well, um, we'll wait this morning I'll probably mostly bombard you a little bit and then we'll get into all the ramifications of what this brings up so where are we presence is presence is self-engagement with itself presence is hyper-intelligence hyper-sensitive self-engagement with itself um, and this self-engagement is what we call attention so not attention like pay attention but attention like like, like um, the presence of experiencing occurs in attention so um, again, don't worry too much about the words because, again, all words are intrinsically inaccurate and hence gibberish. Um, but this is here, this is engaged with itself, and that's what your experience is already. So, every instant of every experience, so you're here at a talk, paying attention, or getting distracted, or whatever you're doing, or you're out at lunch and chatting with friends, you know, or you're, you know, you're in traffic and someone cuts you off and you get pissed off. And whatever's happening, all that's actually happening is the presence of your hyper-intelligent transcendental presence looking at itself, being engaged with itself. That's all that's ever happening. And it looks like all this shit. It looks like whatever's going on. It looks like, you know, moment-to-moment events that as human beings we're all very used to being able to talk about and, and, and orient towards and get upset about and so on and so forth. But we typically don't notice the the, the 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 baseline of presence of experiencing, which which is in fact the only thing that's actually happening. You know, an exact analogy that is quite easy to talk about um, is uh, our dreams. You know, since since we, dreams are, are a special case because dreams are a kind of experience that you can find this you can lose yourself in and you can also find yourself outside of which makes it a little bit interesting the waking state's harder to look at because typically when you're not in a waking state you're either sleeping or dreaming or dead or something so it's a little harder to look at it critically you know but dreams fortunately we, we can you can look at dreams now dreams are clearly an example of what we're talking about a dream, when you're lost in a dream, all sorts of eventfulness can seem to occur. You can be there and things can be happening and you're engaged with somebody and you're trying to do this and trying to avoid that. And I mean, just real complexity and, and all sorts of detail and it's all objective and it's all really, really matters or not or whatever. And then you wake up and, oh, it was all a dream. Which means none of it really happened. It just was a presentation. It was a seeing as if it was happening. It was a simulation, essentially. But none of it really happened. None of it was actually there. If you could look at the waking state from the point of view of sleep, um, which is difficult to do because when we're asleep, we're not conscious, at least in terms that the waking condition would recognize, um, you would notice the same thing. As soon as you go to sleep, the waking state utterly and completely disappears. It's not like it's sitting there waiting for you somewhere. It's gone. It's as gone as a dream does when you leave. When you leave a dream, it's gone utterly. When you go to sleep at night, the waking state is gone utterly. It's just... It's not there because it's not being seen. So, 
being experienced is actuality. Reality consists of the presence of your experiential field. Period. There's no objective world. That's really interesting. There's no other people. That's really interesting. There's your experiential field. Well, wait a minute. There's all these people in my experiential field. Sure. There are all these people in my dream last night too. Where are they now? They may say. They may say. You know, in the middle of a dream, they may say, "Wait a minute. I'm here. I'm talking to you. you know, don't tell me I don't exist, you asshole." You know, I think you don't exist. You know, all, you, all that can happen in a dream. But then you wake up, and who's left? Yeah. Who's the last man standing? <laughs> right. You go to sleep, and where do we all go? You go to sleep and it's just you, right? The world and everyone in it is just, just gone. What do you think happens when you die? Gone. Gone, gone, gone. And when it's gone, it may as well never have been. It was just an instantaneous momentary apparition. So this is a little contrary to the normal human way of thinking of things. I bet most people... Um, hang out in I guess and uh, because of this uh, you know this this yoga can be a, a little bit have, have a little bit of a, uh, of a of a learning curve in terms of because we're so acclimatized to orient to our experience in terms of what's thinkable what's describable what we can talk about or read about or or, or even think about to ourselves and what this actually is is not like that it's weirder than that <clears throat> so this spontaneous attention of presence with itself this spontaneous engagement of presence with itself is the medium by which presence investigates itself Presence is, as I said, as I told you, is, is hyper intelligent, it's hyper functional, hyper capable. So it's not just looking at itself like, uh, duh, drool. It's, it's, it's the genius of genius investigating the nuance and subtleties of every aspect of the way that it is that. And it's doing that already right now, even if it doesn't let you think about it, because you had the bit misfortune to be seduced into the inconceivable clumsiness of human thought. <clears throat> but this engagement, this attention, this hyper intelligent engagement and investigation is what your experience right now actually consists of. Right now, inconceivable intelligence is investigating inconceivable transcendental nature with absolute intimacy. This is what every instant of your experience um, is and, and that's all it has ever been and all it will ever be. <clears throat> so, the yoga is very, very, very simple. It simply consists of noticing that fact. Notice the, the, the engagement of reality with itself, the engagement of presence with itself. Notice that Another way to put it is, and again, all these are, all these verbal ways of putting it are, are completely and utterly inaccurate. So don't hitch on the words; they're just you know they're just jumping off points into the actuality. Um, so you notice that experience is being seen spontaneously. Notice it; you can't stop it. You're not doing it. You know. We're, you know, in, in spirituality, especially like in New Age circles and stuff, people are used to thinking in terms of the small self and the transcendental self, or the little, you know, the little self and the big self, or the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, or whatever. But um, the conscious, the conscious, the small self and the conscious mind and all that are a fabrication of the conceptual mind that doesn't exist. So, so forget about that. Just, and if your mind goes to that, which it will, just just like ignore it because that's just more that's just insanity remember you're a crazy person remember that you're a complete crazy person because to be a human being to to engage in human normalcy is to be totally stone bonkers insane um, so that gives you a frame of reference so when your mind starts trying to get a handle on things you just you pray you know, 
go, you go, go yell it, you know, go in the back corner and yell it. But the engagement of experience with itself does not depend upon the conscious mind. It does not depend upon thought. Whether thought's happening or not, experience is being seen. Experience is being seen intrinsically in real time, right here, right now. And that's what you are, that's all that's happening. And so you, you feel it. How do you feel it? Well, it's the only thing you ever felt. You feel ex- experiencing. I, I, experiencing is the one feeling of the one thing. You know, it seems to present as all of this chaos of characteristics, so it gets very confusing and disorienting, which is where human thought gets to bootstrap itself up and jump in and claim to have validity. Now, what about this? What about that? What about this? All this stuff happening in the thought and I'm seeing it. You know, but that's just that's just taking advantage of the inconceivable weirdness of this absolute differentiation of the presentation of this one event, of this one thing to itself. It presents itself to itself as everything, even though it's only itself, which is very strange. That's another aspect of the way in which what this is is absolutely ungraspable by thought. What kind of an object? What kind of a thing is one thing but looks like everything and is itself invisible and yet is itself the only thing? What kind of an object, what kind of a critter would that be? What would that look like? Well, it looks like this. It's exactly, it's exactly like this. And that's what's really here. This one thing, which is the actuality of your experience and the actuality of your transcendental presence experiencing itself, which is just a a long circumlocution of saying your being, being itself. So this that is here is a complete self-engagement with itself, which looks like this. Like always. Like it always has and always knows. Of course, when I say it looks like this, but it always looks different every instant. Yeah, funny about that. Um, and that's part of its weirdness. You know, how can it possibly look different in itself every instant without any repetition whatsoever? <coughs> Who knows? But that's what, here we are. The evidence is on display. Now, so this presence, this hyper intelligence presence, which is completely self engaged with itself, with absolute intimacy and absolute attention and, 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 and sensitivity. Um, has something to look at because the nature of what this presence is or the nature perhaps it's an artifact of its own self-engagement it looks like all of this inconceivable spectra of experiential characteristics all these colors and sounds and textures and thoughts and vibes and emotion and just basically anything whatsoever that seems to be in anything to any degree whatsoever within your experiential field right all of this stuff, all this uh, seeming event, all this seeming content, is just non-stop, inconceivable data density flooding your experiential field every instant spontaneously. Absolutely spontaneously. Just bang, here it is. There's no effort. There's no process. It's just poof. Instant universe. Instant totality. Instant inconceivable range of information right here right now in your presence it's its nature to do so I use the word radiance to refer to this spontaneous tendency to display as inconceivable characteristics because this display is it feels like a dynamism it feels like it's it's a doing it's somehow jumping out it's it's somehow uh, an, act, an activity, a shining forth. So to me, the word radiance is kind of a nice sort of a euphemism for this quality of, of showing up as all of this inconceivable data. So, radiant presence. Here's the presence. And oh, look at all this radiance. Look at all this stuff. Look at all this and of course, everything as human beings that we're absorbed, that we're you know absorbed with and interested in and think is of importance, is just interpretations of patterns in the radiance. The radiance is very interesting because it's 
it's hyper patterned. It's patterned with an inconceivable fractal infinity. Anywhere you look at patterns, and the patterns are made of patterns, and the patterns are made of patterns, and the patterns are made of patterns. You know, I mean, physicists know this. You know, you look at a you look at a person, and they're made of cells, and you look at the cells, and they're made of molecules, and you look at the molecules, and they're made of atoms, and you look at the atoms, they're made of subatomic particles, look at the subatomic particles, and they're made of quarks. Look at the quarks. If you look closely, they're made of something, and it just goes down forever. Or you dolly back, and then. You look at people and you dolly back and you look at the biosphere. You look at the biosphere and you dolly back you look at the solar system. You look at the solar system, you dolly back and you look at the galaxy. You know, same story. Endless patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns. Um, this is the nature of the radiance. All this patterning. That's what, that's what the problem is in spirituality. Is as human beings, we get seduced by the apparent patternings of the radiance and think it has all sorts of importance in itself. The patterns matter. You matter. This room matters. Seattle matters. You know, um, my life matters. Because all these patterns show up and, I, and, and, and the mind effortlessly interprets them as, as events, as things objectively existing that are in some relationship to, to, to a me which objectively exists and, and this relationship implies certain desires or positivities or negativities of wanting to get something and wanting to have something wanting to avoid something so on and so forth so all the complex narration of human eventfulness is generated spontaneously through interpretations of all of the detail of all these patterns which appear patterns appear in a dream too right and when you're dreaming same thing happens right you interpret it as events and you get caught up in it and all this stuff matters this and that and you try to do this and try to avoid that and all this and you wake up poof it's just patterns it's just a dream right well that's the truth right now too it's just patterns and all the normal human investment in the importance of individual patterns and their inter- apparent interrelationships all of which exists only as abstract interpretations in your imagination um, are nothing they're empty they're empty interpretations of insubstantial patterns of radiance essentially light radiance is basically like light well light is one of the clearest examples of radiance here's light right so you may think you're seeing a room and seeing people and all that but all you're actually seeing is light right now that's very easy to grasp you know oh I'm seeing light yeah I see light you know, if all, of, if all of a sudden there was no light, if suddenly there was a massive, you know, all the lights were off and there was a massive impenetrable black barrier placed over this building, there'd be no light and you wouldn't see um, the room or the people. So you're not seeing a room of people, you're seeing light that seems to have room-like and people-like patterns in it, right? Mm-hmm. And light is very available. You can, what does light look like? Well... It's hard to say what it looks like because it tends to look like what it's reflecting off of. But, you know, you look in a... Still, in all, light has a certain texture, doesn't it? Light has a certain quality. Light is recognizable as light. You know, when you look at light, it's, it's effortless and easy to, to intuit. That's light. You don't think it's sound. You don't think it's, it's touch. Because those have different experiential textures, right? Light has a very recognizable texture of light. So light is a is an aspect of radiance. Light is pure radiance. You know, no light comes from the sun. Light is photons oscillating, traveling at the speed of light exactly in every direction, blah, 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 blah. Bullshit, bullshit. Interpretation, interpretation, wrong. Light is a very immediate and obvious instance, perhaps one of the most accessible instances of the presence of radiance. Light is present in experience that's where it is it's not in space it's present in experience and of course this is easy to verify you close your eyes there's still light you know it looks like these little faint flickers maybe at first you go to sleep there's still light right you start dreaming there's light where does the light in your dreams come from is it coming from the sun you know did you leave a light on right I mean, where does it come from light shows up in consciousness because radiance shows up in consciousness because experience is radiant presence. Experience, presence never shows up naked. It always shows up in fancy dress, and the fancy dress is the radiance of all of these astounding experiential characteristics, which can look like anything, 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 anything. 
I mean, think of every think of every experience you've ever had. It's all made of the same stuff. It all looks inconceivably different. I mean, you know, a memory looks inconceivably different than a you know a stub while you're stubbing your toe. The sensation of stubbing your toe looks like, which looks inconceivably different than anything, you know, <coughs> than, than feeling love or feeling a strong emotion. Right? And yet they're all made of the same thing. Very closely. They're all made of the instantaneous presence of experiential energy, let's call it. Which is just another euphemism for radiance. Which is just another euphemism for this actuality. <coughs> as it is, which is, with all this inconceivable readout, all this inconceivable um, information, apparent information, apparent characteristics of the present. <clears throat> so, this is radiant presence. Your experience is radiant presence. It's nothing other than that, never has been, never will be. Of course, we don't usually recognize that because we're really busy being caught up with who did who did what, when, and what if we have to do when, and what we want, and what we don't want, and blah, 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 the whole story. The horses are off and running. But all of that What's that all based on? What's it being spun off of? It's being spun off of this presence right here, right now, of all this patterning. Always. Because there's nothing else for it to spin off of. You didn't know there was a world until you, until you were experiencing. And even when you were first experiencing, you didn't know there was a world. It took a while before you learned the art, art form of interpreting your experience consisting of a world and bodies and others and situations at first it's just wow just this big presence and it never stopped being that Mm -hmm. see this is this is a great advantage this is a great opportunity the original primal experience never went away what you experience at the instant you were born is exactly what you're experiencing right now you know there may be all sorts of overlays of fancy conceptualization and and you know interpretations of history and memory and blah 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 but but all of that exists within the context it is actually made up of this primal presence of this inconceivable event this soul event which is here now always so yoga is very simple you just notice that <laughs> and of course since you're already always noticing it, that's easy to do. Um, of course, again, the challenge, the, the fly in the ointment is we're really good at not noticing it. We're really good at getting caught up in all our stuff, all our stories and our narration and our self-image and our interpretation, all of which exists in imagination. So, in large part, the yoga in its early stages consists of a kind of a gentle acclimatization a gentle um, moving away from the, our usual life narration and just notice the presence of experience is experience present sure enough is you know, it's, you know and, and you just feel, feel, feel how that presence is inconceivable feel like there's no way you could do this or make it or, how we, or describe it it's just wow and almost instantly you'll go off into thought. Almost instantly you'll go off into you know your story and you'll think, wow, let me let me think about this. Gosh, I read this book by the mind of and he was talking about this way or that. And, cool. So that happens. So the mind goes off into thought. But when it goes off into thought, experience doesn't go anywhere. Here it is. Here it is. So, you know, when you have the wherewithal, you just gently notice the presence of experience. Don't do it by trying to get away from thought to this. Don't turn it into a dichotomy. That's the whole trick. The entire trick is to... There's no bad guys here. Thought itself is radiant presence. So even when you're off in thought, you're actually in experience. And as, as, one, as you develop some sea legs, as you develop some chops with being able to do this yoga, or so do this yoga, you, know, just, you get a sense of this, then you... you you become more and more skilled at being able to be with apparent deviations from the naked fact of this presence as this presence. And ultimately, liberation looks like there's nothing whatsoever 
that could possibly be other than or different than this. You know, everything is completely inclusively included in this, which is of course already the case. So again, it's all a very weird catch-22. It's all just a matter of noticing that that is the case and noticing it um, as a felt, obvious, self-evident, self-verifying certainty. And you know, this is not about what it, what what it, what we think of it. You know, a part of the problem, a part of the challenge in this yoga is that since it's not rational, this orientation to to interpretive frameworks, this orientation to conceptual thought and imagination, is held as a kind of a energy orientation. It's not a, just a thought that somehow there, there's a thought there, and I should not be thinking it. But the orient to the thought is kind of like there's a certain way in which it's, it's almost like there's, there's some subtle posture, some subtle contortion of the way what you're, the energy that you are, the energy that this transcendental presence is, sort of twists itself to do that. And so, um, uh, ultimately, this yoga in the long run consists of rearranging your own subtle energy structure. Now, that's obviously and patently New Age bullshit. But it's also it's also um, profoundly meaningful and relevant in terms of this because um, it, it it's very much a feeling thing, a feeling tone thing. Um, it's the feel of, of one's experience. You know, confusion and delusion, insanity is a, is a is a is a feeling orientation to your experience. It's not a a log- It is a logical mistake, but it's also in some way that's that's not the point the point of it is that that orientation is itself almost a kind of a posturing and so you basically uh, essentially learn to relax the posture of your subtle energy body so so to speak and in that relaxation it opens to its uh, to its more true nature which is simply self-engagement as this totality in real time which of course it never was not but it can feel as if it is when we get into these contortions of delusion. Um, so, in a in a in a very real sense, um, this yoga is is a is about feeling. It's not about thought. It's about feeling. So, um, you know, um, in in you know, I, I uh, we talked about how attention is the basic medium or mode of engagement in this yoga. But the attention is not directed by thought or intention. It's directed by feeling. It's directed by... Because um, feeling is not rational. Feeling is not described. described but, like, feel your fingertips, you're, right? Feel your fingertips right now. You're, 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 you're actually feeling your fingertips, right? There's no... That's a, actuality is completely irrational. There's no way you could say what that is comprehensively, right? And yet it's immediately immediate self-evident actuality that is felt. It's a felt presence. Likewise, experiencing attention is a felt presence. So you, you don't think about attention. You don't, you know, let me look at attention. <laughs> let me give attention to attention. You feel, feel it. Feel attention. You just feel it. And this feeling, experience is felt. Experience is always felt. I'll me back up a little bit. Um, you know, typically with human thought, we're used to abstracting everything. And oh, I'm, you know, the, the consciousness is looking at experience from this whatever its transcendental vantage point and sees blah blah, you know, blah blah, all this stuff. In actuality, experience is felt. Vision is felt. Feel the vision. You know the feel the vision is present because you're feeling it. You're feeling light. You're feeling the presence of vision. Sensation is very obviously felt. You know, sense of touch. Thought is felt. Even thought is a felt presence. How do you know you're thinking? Right? There's the feeling of the textural presence of what we effortlessly recognize as thought. You can't say what it is. It's too weird, of course. But you can't say what anything is, so there's no surprise there. I mean, what's light? You know, we, we think of light as being very familiar and, and obvious. And, yeah, well, this is light. Everyone knows this light. Right? But, if you, but if you really look closely and intimately, but what is it? Who knows? But you can feel it. You can feel light. Feel light. You know. 
And so, so this is this is one of the most powerful tricks in this yoga, is you use feeling as a mode of attention. You feel your experience here. Experience is being felt. Feel it. You just feel it. And again, you, you know, you're going to spin off and your mind will start thinking about things and all that. And that's cool. Don't worry about it. Because that's not a problem. Remember, that's not the enemy. That's not doing it wrong. That's what doing it right looks like. You'll, you'll feel it and then instantly you'll spin off into something. Because another aspect of the nature of the radiance, all this patterning showing up, is it's absolutely it's dynamic and unstable. Your attention is continually zooming in and out and getting big and getting small and noticing this and dancing around. That's its nature. So it is absolute inconstancy. You know, people that have tried to, to do formal meditation where you try and sit and contain the mind or still your thoughts or something will, of course, come up against this fact that, oh my God, I mean, here I am trying not to think and like, who, who turned on the floodgates? You know, who, who, who opened the, flo- the spotlights? It's, you know, it's like a rock show in here. What's all this craziness? And, and again, it, it, because... The, 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 the intrinsic dynamism of attention, of experiencing, um, becomes very obvious when you give it a little attention. You notice it. Ordinarily, we're being swept along by it, so we don't even notice it. Um, for example, when you feel the vision, you know, when you're sitting in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, any situation looking around, typically you may feel like you're just sitting here looking at the looking at what you're looking at. But in actuality, if you look very closely at what your eyes are doing, they're dancing around. They focus on this. You look at someone's face and see what you're actually looking at. You're actually, your eyes dance around like this. You know? And it, it creates the illusion of stability. It creates the, the, the sort of self-verifying um, um, apparition of sort of the stable consistency. But actually, there's this little dancing around. If you try to Try to look at somebody's face, or perhaps your own face, if it's easier for you, in the mirror, with abs- keeping your eyes absolutely, actually, completely fixed on that point. In almost, in almost a second or two, you won't be seeing your face anymore. It'll, it'll go transparent, because it's very weird. Because the eye needs to dance around, this dancing around the focus, to create an illusion of stability. Because if it looks at anything too steadily, the, the transcendental nature of the radiance becomes very apparent. And this applies to the other senses as well. I'm just using vision as an example here. <clears throat> so, um, this intrinsic dynamism of attention, of the dancing around of point of focus, is intrinsic to the nature of the way presence is with itself. It's absolutely unstable. It's absolutely continually morphing and dynamic, dynamic and dancing which is another reason why I like the term radiance. It sort of implies that. Um, And uh, so when you begin to feel into the presence of experiencing, this this dancing around will become immediately apparent. You'll notice, wow, your mind shoots off into this and that, and you see this and this, all of a sudden. So that's not failure. That's success. That's actually seeing the way this actually is, seeing the way it works, seeing its incoherence, its instability. Um, it's a lot like a movie, you know, if you look at, at a, if, you, if you look at movie film or something, there's these individual pictures, and somehow when they all get shown one after another with sufficiently short gap, they sort of forms a, a seeming continuity, you know. But in actuality, there's no continuity at all. It's just these individual flashes, which basically have nothing to do with each other. And this is what experience actually looks like. Every instant is a unique experience which has basically nothing to do with the instance before it and the instance after it. And yet, through this process of kind of dancing around, the attention creates a kind of a faux continuity, you know, a focus for uh, or, or a pseudo, you know, um, coherence where things seem to have to be holding together. But, there's, but it's through a, a, a great dynamism and a great effort that this happens. Um, so again, um, in, in beginning to flirt with this, yoga, beginning to flirt with the nature of actual experiencing, actual attention, this will come to the fore immediately. And be, you'll notice this incredible dynamism and dancing around. And it's very easy to take it because of our human biases. Oh, I'm doing it wrong. You know, I'm getting lost in thought again. Thoughts of the enemy. Attention is good. Attention is good, thought bad. You know, 
but that's completely inaccurate. Um, you're, all you're doing is being with what is, and what is is what is, and so it can't not be what is. What is is what is, so that, so that is, you're already doing it, you can't not do it right. The trick is just to, be, just to notice it, just notice, notice. So you notice it dances around, and that's fine, because at first you'll tend to get caught up in your thoughts and, and spin off, and then you'll, this isn't yoga, this is just my shitty life. <laughs> but, so, so at first, what you do is, you, you know, just sort of, you'll, you'll find yourself spin off, just let it go, spin off, you know, bang, bang, cool. But then, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. let me, let me, is, is experiencing happening? Yeah, I feel it. You'll spin off again, right? And so that's the cycle. You know, it's experiencing happening, feel experiencing, and then the spin-off happens and then feel experiencing. And so this this is this is the yoga, this is the yoga. And it it evolves and morphs almost continuously forever in what it looks like and what it's it's kind of engagement looks like. At first it'll be a kind of a spin seemingly spin off for long periods of time and then you remember wait a minute, wait a minute, let me let me let me feel presence. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And then whoop, spin off for a long time. Cool. It's all good. Um, and eventually, you begin to notice. You get more subtle because you build up chops. See the intelligence. Because you're not trying to figure this stuff out. You're not trying to think about it. You're not trying to make sense of it and, and write a thesis. You're training yourself to be sensitive to the hyper irrational, hyper intelligence that your attention already consists of. It has its own language. So you begin to learn that language as you feel the presence of attention. And uh, you know, gradually, or, or when it happens, as it happens, it happens. And as you learn this language, you sort of develop, it shows up as sort of a deeper appreciation of richness, of, of um, inclusiveness, of, of subtlety, of being able to be with nuance and you begin to be able to be with the spinning off as it too and so on and so forth but then again, eventually you get to a point where the, spin, you know, you, the spinning off feels like a spinning off and you're just gone and again so you repeat the project come, sooner or later you just come back to feel experiencing feel the presence of noticing feel the fact that this is actually spontaneously experiencing itself fact feel Spin off, fat feel spin off, and basically that's the yoga. And over a course of time, it evolves and morphs, um, and your sensitivity to what it is and the way that it is evolves and morphs until, it, before very long at all, you will be inconceivably beyond the human realm in terms of ways in which you participate in within experiencing your experience, which of course you already are but you'll be noticing it, you'll be participating in it consciously, rather than being this conscious, crazy person dupe, pathetic human being suffering through your crappy life. You'll be this transcendent, transcendental actuality that you actually are, which exists beyond space and time, exists beyond individuality. It literally does, it already does, it already is that, but you very quickly come to participate in with it on that level, on its own intrinsic level, as that. And that's what all the fancy mystical books are about. The Atman is fully realized here and now. Satchitananda. I mean, all this stuff, I mean, all the, all the stuff, you know, the Vedas, all this, this inconceivably bizarre metaphysical hyperbole it's all literally true yeah this is God this is absolutely transcendental this is beyond space and time you know you never were born you never will die all this is literally actually factually true and you and through this yoga you've come to discover that and participate with experiencing it at, on that level so to speak um, very directly for yourself <clears throat> so that is the yoga ready presence. I think it would be good to start off uh, looking at <coughs> the relationship between what let's call it direct experience, a raw experience, and interpretation. This relationship is inconceivably complex and subtle, 
and befuddling and confusing and is is basically the thing that we're likely to have been tripping over all along. Um, interpretation and raw experience are not a dichotomy. They are not opposites. The one is not, you know, north and the other isn't south. They're not uh, a polarity at all. They coexist. They eternally and intrinsically coexist. There is never, there's no such thing as raw experience without interpretation. And there's no such thing as interpretation without raw experience. Um, it's very easy in this kind of a um, exploration of yoga, like uh, like we've been, like we dealt with yesterday at Great Links, it's very easy to dichotomize them and to hold interpretive interpretation and mentality and all that is sort of the bad guy is the, the devil that's like the, the bad thing that you try not to do and then the good thing is to is to be noticing raw direct experience raw experience what have you um, and that's um, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting point of view but it's not accurate and uh, and it's not really very useful beyond um, just a real getting started kind of a beginning uh, engagement. Um, when you begin to look at your experience, of course, you'll notice that um, raw experience and interpretation coexist. You know, there's always, you know, you, you look at your experience and you experience whatever you're experiencing and you experience it in the context of a mentality, in the context of a, of a, 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 a you know, profound, um, very functional, very intelligent, uh, automatic assessment and interpretation that the mind instantaneously spits out and generates. So these two worlds are always, you know, coexisting, interpenetrating. Um, they do not block each other, and this is the great. This is the great um, uh, um, aspect that we take advantage of in this yoga, um, because in, in ordinary, let's say, a human human normalcy and normal human consensual reality mindset, people tend to think of their interpretive experience as being objectively true. They tend to smear these two things together with a bias towards and a dominance towards the interpretation. So even though the raw experience, let's call it, the sensory experience, you know, the patterns, the colors, the colors you see, the actual sounds you hear, the actual sensations you feel, and all this sort of thing, are present, um, the dominance tends to go to, oh, I'm feeling my fingers touching each other, I'm feeling my butt on the chair, I'm, I'm seeing a room and a bunch of people in a colorful clothing, and so on and so forth, which of course is uh, in, in mental interpretation. But it coexists with the actuality of the presence of the colors, the presence of the tingling in consciousness, and so on and so forth. So, um, this sort of fork in the road, to, you know, every instant, I mean, to sort of, to sort of paint it metaphorically, every instant, if you look at your experience, you're at a fork of the roads, and you're looking at direct experience, and you're looking at an interpreted framework. And it's always the case. It's not like you can move towards one or towards the other and leave the other behind. You, even if you try to do that, you find yourself at the same fork of the roads. And you're always at this fork. You're always at the fork of the roads. There's always um, direct experience, raw experience, and there's always um, you know, mental interpretation uh, present in experience. <coughs> I um, wonder if I'm sensing, I, I'm experiencing sensation <laughs> without thought. Is that the raw experience? Are you saying that is or isn't objective? It's all objective. It is objective. Everything exists. But it's not. As soon as it, as soon as you say it's a sensation, that's already an interpretation. Because it's words. Because it's an idea, it's an interpretation. It's being held as something. I mean, interpreta interpretation is subtle. Um, you know, there's gross interpretation, like having 
words, having labels, having descriptions, having history, you know, like quoting, quoting an encyclopedia entry. And there's subtle, subtler layers of ever interpretation, which is just a kind of a knowing that, oh, this is vision, even if I don't put it into those words. The vision itself doesn't even know it's vision. It's just this amazing presence. That's brilliant. And now just help me understand <coughs> objective, what's objective and what's not objective. I don't get that. The, well, objective and subjective is not a useful qualification. It's not. Everything is subjective and everything is objective. Mm-hmm. There's, no, there's no meaningful difference. Everything is in your experience. Everything is your experience. So if you want to say, but that's all complete subjectivity, that's solipsism, so be it. Or you can say, everything actually exists, and the only thing that exists is my experience, and that's the objective fact, and that's total, there's no subject there at all. It's all objectivity. And that's another way of stating exactly the same condition. There's only one thing present that includes all of its aspects. So whether you want to qualify that as subjective or objective is is splitting hairs irrelevantly. Subjective and objective is, again, is an interpretation that is relevant if you believe it's relevant. It happens to, in in fact, not be relevant. Okay, I'll leave that one. Thanks. So so anyway, um, so by and large, this is all about um, developing discrimination. It's not about leaving interpretation and somehow going to raw experience. It's about being able to notice the spectrum. So experience, you can see, it's perceived as like a kind of a gradient, a, conti- a continuum, a spectrum, with at one extreme, it, it's, which, there isn't actually an extreme, but let's say at one, at one direction is more interpretive, more mentality, at another direction is more direct, um, call it energetic presence or substance or what have you. Um, and again, the the problem of the normal human mindset, you know, which in spirituality technically can be called ignorance or being a samsara or something, depending on what your framework is, which is not at all important. Um, the problem with that is we think it's all just smeared together. You know, this is a chair, and I'm seeing the chair, but it is a chair. Whereas in actuality, it's much, much more multidimensional than that. You know, there's the energy presence of the experience of this presence, and there's the interpretation as chair, and they, they coexist. They commingle. They're aspects of the same actuality, the same present instant of, of um, the sort of gestalt, let's call it, of the, of the present um, uh, 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 actuality, the, the, the present um, radiance. So there's so the trick is to notice notice the bias, and humans typically are way over biased towards mentality, towards interpretation, and humans typically, unless they're aesthetes or artists or people who really focus on particularities of um, typically sensory experience or what have you. Um, you know, this, that, so it's, it's really very minor subclasses of people that, are, that emphasize um, more in the raw experience aspect of things. Um, so getting that there is this smear, getting that there is this gradient um, is very interesting because then you notice that things things are not unified. Things are very complex constellations of coexisting energies, you know, much of which are, you know, very mental, much of which are very sensory or, let's just say, uh, you know, more energy presence, um, you know, raw energy presence and consciousness and so on and so forth. But um, experience itself is not a nice neat whole. It's not a nice neat package, which when one is lost in, when one is biased towards, um, more towards interpretive frameworks, seems to be the case. You know, this is the world and we are in an art gallery and this is a spiritual meeting and we are doing this and that and it all kind of clumps together into this 
this love that is kind of one thing and the description more or less encamp- encompasses it whereas in actuality it's a hopelessly fragmented disintegrated chaotic um, uh, uh, gobbledygook of just inconceivable information you know much of which is more just sort of you know strange irrational energy presence as much of which is sort of abstract interpretations and there's all of these things sort of you know coexist like a like a you know like a conglomerate you know of you know if you have concrete and rocks and twigs and dirt and everything in a big ball and you sort of mush it together and say look at this ball it kind of looks like a ball but if you look at it it's actually like just all kinds of different things that don't really have much to do with each other but they're all together they're all just here now so of course you know I'm I am using words and so which of course emphasize the idea side of things which I, which you know, we talked about at some length yesterday, is intrinsically inaccurate. So it's not actually like that. But that is an interesting and and it's not wholly meaningless to put it as if it was like that. It, it, is, uh, it can be valuable to look at it in those terms and and to begin to notice the complexity and the subtlety and the lack of integration in your momentary experience. And, and even even lack of integration it's not a lack of integration that is an actual lack of integration separated from integration again that itself is a continuum it's a, it's a matter of degrees of lack of in- integration with degrees of integration and in all sorts of gobbledygook in between it just doesn't it doesn't come together into a simple wholeness it's an infinitely complex infinitely subtle infinitely nuanced continuum which is one thing by default because it's all here now but it's infinitely differentiated and fragmented and 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 um, um, well differentiated and fragmented so and it's not just that fact you know here's your experience and yeah it, it, you know, it's all of these different aspects that coexist they don't really have much to do with each other you know, I mean, um, you know, seeing the colors that are showing up in my field of vision doesn't have much to do with my memory that also shows up in my mind of what I was doing last night. And, I mean, this, that, and just all of these different little chunks and pieces and little flashes, little snippets of content in very, you know, some of which are obviously relatively abstract and some of which are obviously very concrete, sensory, and so on and so forth. And they coexist, you know, sort of spatiotemporally. They, or they're all sort of here now. But other than that, there, it's just this, this, this incredibly um, nuanced, subtle, multidimensional, you know, this. this, this, this. And of course, we're all very familiar with this because this is normalcy. I mean, it's always been exactly like that, and it's even obviously like that. But. You know, typically, if we don't attend to it, if we aren't edgy with it, if we aren't critical with it, it's easy to go kind of numb and go to a line of least resistant kind of consensual reality narration where, hi, how you doing? What did you do yesterday? Oh, I did such and such. And that becomes kind of almost the whole truth <laughs> as opposed to an absurdly oversimplified smidgen that has absolutely nothing to do with anything compared to the, the vast, See of transcendental information that your experience actually consists of. So it's really just a matter of noticing that fact. That's all. It's not. You can't make sense of it. I mean, even this description of it is not something that. Yeah, that's how it is. It's not even like that. But the description points out that it's it's definitely not like we usually think it is. <laughs> or let's say people normally or, or habitually. The, the default mode, the default human mode, and the default human mindset of, of you know, things that this is what's going on pretty much. You know, I, I kind of got a handle on things. You know, yeah, right. Like that can happen. <laughs> you know, this. So it's noticing that it's all, it, it, the cutting edge of all of this is in the details. Okay, numbness and stupidity and over is in oversimplification. Is in broad strokes. You know, um, so you know, the, the, uh, 
uh, ignorance is well here we are at a spiritual meeting broad stroke the pretense that that includes everything accurately then you get let's zoom in let's zoom in like what colors are present in what instance what flavors are present in what instance what smells are present in what instance what mental sings and zaps and moods are present in what instance I mean the details are inconceivably complex and nuanced and subtle and unintegrated the, you know these, all of these flashes and snippets of experiential content that don't necessarily have much to do with each other except they coexist right in, in the moment in, in the flow of, in the parent flow of experience and so it's in the details that the actual condition is revealed you know and this, this can be a little contrary I think a lot of sort of sloppy spiritual thinking suppose is you're supposed to sort of space out and get vague and like oh, you know, oh okay now I'm, you know, let go of the world you know go and think. it's exactly the opposite of that mm-hmm. it's in really getting very very sharp and precise with exactly what you're experiencing um, in the moment that liberation is discovered that transcendence is discovered transcendence is not discovered by going away from things transcendence is discovered by being way way up close and personal way way edgy with things um, it, it, so all the details all the nuance and um, you know of course you never get a handle on it but that's part of what you discover when you get up close and personal but you go wow this is just too much and it's too much more it's too much more than too much and too much more than that and it, I mean even too much of course is an absurd qualification but you know it's just you you begin to really get at the proof the intimate undeniable verification of how bizarre this is how incredibly um, um, well too much this <laughs> is too much to get a handle on in, in a simple sense but just too much poetically it's too much I mean if you're not looking at this going wow you know fuck me <laughs> this is wow you know um, I mean that's just that's just beginning to, to scratch the surface of how bizarre this is and, 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 and all of that is discovered by really being with what's there very precisely by going, going into it by engagement by intimacy not by some kind of a withdrawal or getting fuzzy or you know um, denying or transcending or something you don't need to transcend it because it is itself transcendental and if you're trying to transcend it you're pretending it's not transcendental and it needs to be transcended which which reifies it as a problem which it isn't it's the solution Relax, be comfortable, be loose and easy, however, however you're comfortable in the space. No, no need for special postures or holdings or thinking something or seeing something or being any particular way. Just loose and easy, it's natural, whatever happens. I sit in this funny posture, but it's not because it's any advantage to it, it's just because I can't sit on the floor comfortably unless I do. So it's just expedient. <clears throat> Just feel what is here. Mm. You notice how it's always being felt. Experiences by feeling. Light is felt. Thought is felt. Sensation is felt. Sound is felt. Automatically. You don't need to do anything can't not do it just here Mm. just feel what that is feel this texture the texture of experience itself
Once you get float and drift, spontaneously, effortlessly, like always. <clears throat> This is real. This is actual. This is not a concept. This is really here. Feel what it is. What is it that's here? <coughs> Explore it by feeling it. <clears throat> itself. You can't start it and you can't stop it. Just ongoing flow, continual. Completely open, completely naked, unblocked, just here, just this. Like always. these flavors, all these textures.
just experience, like always, this that is here. What is this? flows through itself, unimpeded. Always felt this presence, all these flavors, all these frequencies. <coughs> Just exactly like it is. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
just feeling this presence, everything. these wisps of flavor, eddies of energies, wafting through. Just listen easy, relax, be comfortable, just feeling this like always. Feel what it is. However it presents, just this.
You be loose, be relaxed, be easy. There's no need to hold anything, there's no need to lock into anything. <coughs> Feel the experience itself. What does the experience feel like? What's it made of? <clears throat> what is this present? <clears throat> How can this be? It drifts in and out of itself. It gets clear, it gets fuzzy, it gets busy. All these flavors, all these textures. No, it's just this. It does everything. It is everything. You don't need to preserve it, you don't need to hold it, you can't disturb it. It's always here, just just as it is. 
Polynésie. Tension floats around continuously, drifting here and there, settling in various flavors and moving on, just like always. Doesn't matter where it goes, it never gains anything, never loses anything. There's this continual motion, continual floating. <clears throat> is felt, it is feeling. <clears throat> it is life.
no matter what flavors, no matter what feelings it presents, it's just this presence. It never gains or loses anything. Here, this here, like always. Mm -mm. <clears throat> 